So we just use that as a as a good basis for building digital photographs of the region. And then what we're going to do is overlay on top of that or direct by um, satellite imagery so we can look at environmental change and I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Um, once we've got the image map, it's not really that useful in certain contexts, so we, we derive um, a feature map or a line map from it um, showing the principal features. And this is the sort of map that might go to the Antarctic Treaty System. Um, so this is another site in the Taylor Valley. Um, you can see um, several protected areas here. This is a specially protected area. This is a sort of special management zone. And we've got facilities here for science. Um, before I bring up the next slide, just note the shorelines here. This is 1993. And um, this is from 2009, a quick bird image. And there's quite a dramatic difference in the shorelines of, of, the, um, of the lake there, Lake, lake Frixel. So I don't know if you can pick that up. I'll just look back and you probably see this island here has changed quite a lot from here as well. The lake levels are rising quite recently, so over a 10 to 15 year period it's, it's really quite different. Um, the glaciers are also changing. So we need to update that as well. And this is where remote sensing really changes the game because we, we've got imagery which we can get now every year repeatedly. And not just that, we can get it in stereo um, using worldview imagery in particular recently. Um, recent uh, stereo is really important to us. Is, um, the biggest, one of the biggest problems we have is actually getting a good digital elevation model so that we can correct this imagery and get a good map out of it. Um, previously, we were kind of limited to very poor DEMs like, um, uh, well, we were using Aster, which is um, you know kind of okay, but we found some real problems with it in different places. So um, increasingly, we're trying to move away from that and uh, build the DEMs from stereo pairs of um, worldview or, or quick bird imagery. Um, OK, so that's, that's just the late level change thing again. Um, one of the reasons why we won't map these things accurately is to assess and map the boundaries of these areas. Um, Legally speaking, if you have a boundary which is poorly defined or, or not mapped properly, you can't really enforce um, protected area management provisions because you don't know if somebody's inside or outside the protected area. So we spend quite a lot of time actually demarcating the boundaries of the protected area and, and the imagery and the mapping is really important for that. Um, just a couple of examples of, protect, of specially protected areas that we've been working at. Um, Cape Hallett in the Northern Ross Sea and one on the peninsula called Gisco Point. Um, and there's a couple of other sites, uh, Blood Falls and Shark Island, which uh, I'll also mention. Um, so Cape Hallett is a site in the Northern Ross Sea. Um, it's very remote, difficult to access, um, and you need to put a lot of logistics together to get in there. So. Before um, making the visit, um, we tasked satellite imagery to acquire, uh, using QuickBird, uh, regular images throughout November of 2009. Um, basically, every couple of days, we were, we were getting images so that we could assess what the sea ice conditions were like, because we needed to land on the sea ice in order to make the site visit. Um, so that was a, a really useful tool and um, meant that we could plan our field work right there on the spot pretty much uh, the week out. Because we were getting, we were down in Murdo Station and getting the, the satellite imagery fed to us there. Um, eventually we did um, fly up there on twin auto aircraft and landed off in the sea ice some distance away from here. And the area is protected for its wildlife and, um, and, and also vegetation. So it's, it's limited places where you can actually land an aircraft. Uh, in, in case you disturb the, 
the wild life. And um, that sort of light brown area there is um, penguin colony. The daily penguins is something like 63,000 pairs uh, at this site. Um, so we couldn't use quick bird imagery to count the birds um, because it's not high enough resolution. Uh, and there's no aerial photography available, not vertical anyway. So we did take some photographs from the air, oblique, and then later uh, we stitched those together from different angles and um, counted the birds from, from these aerials. Um, quite a fun task um, for five days for one of our staff. Um, it's actually quite, quite difficult to count these birds accurately. Um, this is probably one of the better um, sort of pictures here that it seems relatively clear, but where you've got rocks and things that can um, sometimes look like birds, it's, it's quite tricky. And there's a, there's a certain amount of error associated with that count. Um, so I was mentioning that there's limited areas we can land aircraft. Um, this is sort of, well, one means of access. Uh, and one of, one of our tasks was to actually assess how the um, uh, aircraft access should be best managed. We used the satellite image um, to try and develop the, the, these rules and then um, created a map which is used as a guide for the pilots. So quite a practical sort of use of satellite imagery. And then the pilots have this before they go up to the area and then they know exactly where they should land, like in this case, um, this is the primary landing site. Now, if there's no sea ice, they've got a problem. Um, basically, if there's no sea ice, you can't land a fixed wing. Um, you could land a helicopter um, up here, but you're quite close to the birds, so it's um, not recommended if you can avoid it. Um, this is imagery that the British Antarctic Survey shot. Um, who was it? Nelson, it was uh, 2009. Right, February 2009, Shaka. <coughs> and um, we were hoping um, that we could count the birds from this, but because of the presence of the rocks there and sort of ambiguity, we found that actually it's quite difficult to really identify them. Um, so even with aerial photography, um, sometimes you can't get quite what you want and you're still going to have to go into the field and, and do a ground survey. This is another site that Bass shot, um, Pisco Point, and um, this is a site where there's been quite dramatic changes in the bird uh, colonies, and uh, we were revising the management plan for this site, and um, I was quite surprised to see that in 10 years the bird population, or the uh, Gen 2 penguin population, has doubled, and they've occupied new areas, so we needed to totally revise the aircraft access provisions that the new areas have been colonized for up here. Previously, there was just a little colony down here. And um, so before that, the, the boundary line for the aircraft access was right along this ridge line. So we've shifted that now well away from the birds so that um, they're not disturbed when people access the site. Um, so this is um, part of the flight lines that were flown by bats. And um, just kind of gives you an idea of the coverage. This is, um, Amber's Island on the Antarctic Peninsula. Um, what we're hoping to do over the next year or two is to develop, um, use this photography to develop uh, high quality maps for this area. Um, so this is one of the um, images from that photography program. This is Palmer Station here. And um, actually Alison could probably uh, jump in here and tell us all about the changes in the ice fronts. Um, that have been occurring. This, this used to be, uh, have a, an ice bridge across there, but a couple of years ago it completely broke up and now this area is an island, what was a peninsula. Shown on all the maps at the moment as a peninsula, but it's now an island. One of the other things, 